I was recently invited to make a little presentation at the uh, Washington, New Jersey Kiwanis Club uh, regarding the community theater that my wife Carolyn and I helped to create uh, back in 1972. And uh, in the little presentation, I kind of talked about how the whole thing started and uh, how it has evolved and, and where it is now and where it might be going in the future. So I thought maybe I would uh, kind of transfer that talk into a little video uh, that we could post for anyone who might be interested in it. So uh, I made the presentation at the Kiwanis Club on December 1st. And today is December 14th, 2015. So here it is, and I hope you find it interesting. Hello, my name is Bill, and I'm here today to talk to you about the Country Gate Playhouse, which you see in the photo in front of you. The Country Gate Playhouse is a community theater located in Belvedere, New Jersey. It was established in 1972, and it has a mission of providing uh, opportunities uh, for education and uh, creative uh, endeavor for the participants, as well as performance opportunities for the community as members of the audience. This is the way we look today in Belvedere, New Jersey, just across the Delaware River uh, from Pennsylvania. Uh, but we started in Washington, New Jersey, which maybe is 10 miles or so to the south of Belvedere. And it started right here in the First Presbyterian Church in Washington. Uh, folks there very accommodating and very generous, allowing us to use one of their Sunday school rooms uh, for rehearsals. And that's how it all started. And here I am in one of those uh, classrooms in the Presbyterian Church. That's me to the left. My hair is a lot darker in this picture than it is now. I was probably 23 years old there. And uh, on the right is my late wife, Carolyn Scarato, who I met at West Liberty State College in 1966. And it wasn't too long after that that she and I both decided that we would be in it for the long haul. And as young couples do, we talked about our aspirations and goals. And, and even at that early stage, uh, we both were very sure we wanted community theater to be part of our lives wherever we happened to land because we both believed in the power of the theater as an educational tool and a tool for enrichment and enlightenment. So here we are kind of living out that that goal and uh, our first show was a, a little known comedy at least in these days of Sumner Arthur Long's uh, Never Too Late. A one set show a requiring, I think, about eight people in the cast. And uh, fortunately, about eight people turned out to audition for that show, so we were up and running. That first show was produced at the Warren Hills Regional High School, which is a local high school in the Washington area. Big auditorium, seats about a 1,000 people, and with our little one-set show, uh, we were very happy to have drawn about 100 people to each performance, but they did, lo they did look lost in that huge auditorium. But we weren't discouraged, we continued and started doing musicals. This was our first musical, The King and I. There's Madame Leah Owens arriving in, uh, in Bangkok, and there, of course, is the king in the center of that picture. And uh, we were off and running, and we learned two things about uh, doing, doing shows uh, through The King and I. One, that musicals certainly were a bigger draw than straight plays. And, both for participation and for people coming to see from the audience perspective. And also, it's a very good idea, whenever possible, to use children in your show. Number one, the children have a wonderful time and they have a great experience. And number two, it doesn't hurt your box office one bit to have a lot of children in a show. So one of the most popular songs in the show is the March of the Siamese Children. Ours went on for 15 minutes because we had so many kids. It was great. We also did some shows in the uh, Washington Memorial School. And this is the first show we did there, Fiddler on the Roof. Again, me to the left there playing Tevye for the first time, uh, a, a, sh a role that I, I certainly cherish. Uh, and it was a privilege to perform it. I did it uh, here when I'm in my 20s. I would do it four more times in my life. The last time I did it, I was in my 50s, 
which is about the age Tevye is supposed to be. And uh, of course, I'm in my 60s now. And if someone asked me if I would do it again, I would I would jump at it in a heartbeat because it is a wonderful, wonderful role. We also did some shows at the uh, Washington Borough Hall, believe it or not. It's a large uh, room upstairs at the Borough Hall. And we did several shows there. The one I remember the most was uh, Mr. Scrooge, which was a uh, musical adaptation of A Christmas Carol. So at this point, we've had uh, some pretty good success. We uh, uh, are getting a good following in terms of audience. We're getting a large membership in terms of participation. And we're getting this crazy idea that wouldn't it be nice to have our own home, our own venue? So uh, we started looking around in Washington at first because that was our home base. And we looked uh, especially at the, uh, the old Erie Lackawanna Railroad Station, which was in uh, Washington. Of course, it was not in use anymore and it had gone uh, into, into disrepair. And we thought it would be a, a lovely idea if that could be turned into a community arts center with the theater kind of as the centerpiece of it. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, damage and the the cost for restoration of that building was out of our out of our sight at that point, particularly, and uh, without a, a particular partner to go in it with us, it was something uh, that we had to kind of set aside. So we thought, okay, we'll go back and we'll do our thing as a. Uh, uh, you know, looking at these different venues where we would go to the high school and the middle school and the borough hall and whatever. Uh, but then uh, I also worked in this place. This is uh, a radio station, WCRV AM 1580, licensed to Washington, New Jersey. I had some very happy years there. I worked there for 10 years, or at least 10 years, I would say. I'm not sure exactly how long I worked there. I was both a, a news reporter and a DJ. My air name was Buffalo Bill, believe it or not. I spent many happy years at WCRV, but I was working there one night, and I received a phone call from Irene Smith, who was at that time the mayor of the town of Belvedere. And she said to me, we heard you are looking for a venue for your, your theater. Would you consider coming to Belvedere? And she mentioned this place, the old Belvedere Movie Theater. Again, built in 1939, it had been vacant for a number of years. Well, we never really thought too much about going to Belvedere. And uh, for some reason, people who live in Washington think Belvedere is the other side of the moon, but it's really only about 10 miles and actually a 10, 15 minute drive. But, uh, you know, it's not a very good picture, but that is basically, that's it. I recognize it. So we decided to give this a shot, especially because the mayor of Belvedere said she would uh, support that that move. And so here I am, back in the day, it's, this is probably June of 1978, that in that era, I'm up on a ladder, uh, sprucing up uh, the old Belvedere movie theater marquee, and there you see, coming in September, Camelot. I'm working on, on that. So we were in there, we had some great volunteers, and that's something that I definitely need to point out that we have been fortunate over the years to have so many dedicated volunteers who have come forward to help get this thing ready. So uh, we're working on it. We had a little reception in the lobby of the theater. And uh, this is uh, Carolyn, who is uh, talking to some reporters, uh, people. We did a little tour of the building that day. Uh, here's the opening night, and that's the mayor in the middle there. She's uh, She's uh, cutting the ribbon. That's Carolyn and me on either side. And that's another of our good friends, Sal, to the right, to the left of me, who uh, he was a, also a charter member of, of this, uh, this idea that we had. So inside there is a Camelot. That's our first production. And uh, we were off and running. And, uh, you know, people were supportive. People seemed happy that the building was being put to good use. This is the Roar of the Grease Paint, another show done during that first, I believe during that first season. This is uh, uh, a Neil Simon comedy, The Last of the Red Hot Lovers. And this is Man of La Mancha, another show done during that first uh, year. And here is a picture from our production of Oliver uh, that was done at the theater. We've got some, some good, uh, good young people in there. One particularly that I wanted to mention is 
on your on the left end there, and that's David. And here's a, a little better picture of David. He became one of our prominent volunteers, someone who uh, actually was very good on stage. This is a picture of him grown up uh, now in a production of uh, Miss Saigon that took place a few years ago. And uh, a very good performer on stage, but also a very gifted set designer and builder. Uh, and uh, he has been a volunteer who has helped us in so many different ways uh, with electrical work, with plumbing work, with roof work. Here he is up on the roof along with uh, uh, Alan, another of our volunteers, uh, this past summer working on a roof and uh, gutter project that uh, was badly needed to be done. Volunteers are the reason this theater has uh, has survived for all these years. This is the way the theater looks inside now, and uh, all those seats were brought in from a uh, another uh, from another movie theater that was being torn down. When we first went in there, the seats went right up to uh, the proscenium, where there was just a screen. There was no stage. Uh, David and others built that uh, built that stage, and of course uh, the the fact that the building had been uh, vacant for so many years, the roof had been bad, the roof, the ceiling was kind of falling apart, and so our volunteers installed a completely new ceiling. Again, something that uh, would have cost thousands and thousands of dollars had not been done by volunteers. This is one of our favorite volunteers, uh, our friend Howard, uh, our late friend Howard, and uh, we just lost him a few months ago. And uh, what a wonderful man, a uh, uh, lifelong resident of Belvedere, was an electrical contractor, a plumbing contractor. He did so many, many things for us. He introduced himself to me and Carolyn early on and over the next 30 years, uh, probably provide hundreds of hours of, of labor, advice, and just good encouragement. Uh, I, I've said it many times, our theater would not have survived nearly as long were it not for the generosity of this man who, you know, as, as much as he did for us, he did that for everybody. He was a man who will be very much missed. And here are Alan and Vic, two other very important volunteers, both contributed immensely to our effort. There's Scott on the left. He designed that marquee. He has done many, many volunteer uh, years as well. Alan's in the middle and up high on that uh, ladder is uh, is Gina, uh, my daughter Gina, who has become really the face of the theater now, uh, kind of passing the torch to the next generation. There's Gina in Annie Get Your Gun. She did many, many roles on stage, including uh, in Funny Girl. She was Fanny Bryce in Cabaret. She was Sally Bowles. Lots of great roles. But today she's known primarily as our director, our set designer, our builder, uh, She's the one people call now when uh, they want to know something about our playhouse. And uh, I'm very proud of that because, you know, it's so nice when you getting up in age and, you know, you've done some work and you've had some accomplishments and then you pass the baton to the next generation, knowing that the next generation is going to take it farther than and you were ever able to do it. And that's really, that's really a great feeling. Here are some of Gina's more recent productions that she has done as a director. This is um, Jesus Christ Superstar. This is The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Here, of course, The Wizard of Oz. Shrek the Musical, a couple of summers ago, big hit. And just this past summer, Mary Poppins. And, uh, and our most recent show, the uh, uh, musical version of The Addams Family. So all these shows are big musicals with family appeal, and those certainly are the shows that do the best for us in terms of keeping us going on a financial basis. They draw people come to come to see the shows. That's the, what they want to see. But our mission is also to provide other types of shows that are thought-provoking, perhaps. Uh, this one is a production of Angels in America, uh, which, of course, is uh, a a story about the political overtones of, of the AIDS crisis. It was, I thought, a fine production. Did not sell very well. And I think most theaters can say that, you know, the heavier the shows are, the least they is, they're selling. Most people, I think, probably want to go to the theater to kind of escape from this, this kind of reality. But we think as a theater company, it's important for us to continue 
to make these plays available uh, for our community. This was a show we just did a couple of years ago called, of course, you probably know, The Diary of Anne Frank. Very important show for, for people to see, especially in this day and age. And of course, uh, it didn't sell very well at all either, but we did manage to attract some school uh, groups to come to see it. And that really, that was very beneficial and very uh, enlightening and rewarding for us as well. Since The King and I, we've always felt that it was important for us to dedicate part of our efforts to encouraging children to be involved in the theater. This is a, a scene from many, many years ago, probably mid-80s, early 80s, uh, free to be. And uh, that's my other daughter, Chelsea, uh, who is uh, in the middle of that picture. Today, Chelsea is the mother of twins. You'll often see her in our box office helping uh, manage things at the theater. Uh, she, whenever we can convince her, we'll try to get her on stage to do things like uh, she was wonderful in uh, Agnes of God and most recently in uh, On Golden Pond. So she's talented in, in many ways. Right now, she spends most of her efforts dealing with her two beautiful children, my grandchildren. That's Lily and Sophia. Sophia and Lily, as the, as the picture states there, they were uh, made their debut on the stage a couple of years ago in Miss Saigon as they shared the role of Tam. And uh, that was pretty thrilling to see them up there. We also do workshops. Here's some pictures of a, this is a picture of a nice workshop we uh, did for young people a couple of uh, years ago. And many of these young people have gone on and uh, joined us on stage in our productions. This is a production of Annie Jr. that we did about a year ago. Everybody here is teenage and lower. And uh, that's kind of fun to, to do shows dedicated to children and, and, you know, and youth. Uh, this is another show that we did, an original uh, musical adaptation of Tom Sawyer. Uh, and again, uh, the, the girl on your left there, uh, Paige, has grown up in our theater in many ways and has done some wonderful roles. Uh, full circle, we're back to another uh, a more recent production of Oliver. And again, you see a lot of uh, young people uh, involved in this production. In addition to our main stage shows, we also do dinner theater. And here are some iconic photos, <laughs> I say facetiously, of some of our participants in dinner theater, where we get, to write, get the right to go over the top pretty much. Uh, and our murder mysteries. And, uh, you know, we kind of book these out to different organizations who are looking to, to raise funds. They raise funds, we raise funds, and everybody has fun. And uh, that's something that has also turned out to be an integral part of our theater. And uh, who would have ever thought that uh, back in uh, the days at the uh, Presbyterian Church? Of course, when we started the theater, Back in 1972, there weren't even answering machines. And uh, we communicated through our landlines, kind of a hit or miss basis. And over the years that the theater has been in existence, things have changed a lot. A, an incredible technology revolution has taken place in our time. And of course, we have cell phones now, but we have also so many other tools that help us do a good job in letting people know about our theater. Uh, this is a picture of our website, and, uh, you know, anyone can turn to this page at any time of the day or night and find out what's going on at our theater. You see here in 2015, we're getting ready to open our Christmas review. And what I like about this most, that little black uh, rectangle at the bottom of that screen, uh, a, a potential customer can click on that button and not only... Uh, pick the performance they want to see, they can pick their seats, they can pay for their tickets, and they can print out their tickets, and they can come to our show, walk right in the front door, and not have to stand in line at all, just walk right to their seat. It's, it's unbelievable to me that that's possible. We also have a Facebook page, an Instagram page, and a Twitter page. So as we uh, look at the whole thing and moving forward, we're, uh, again, having to be so, so indebted to the dedicated volunteers who have come forward over the years to keep this thing going. 
and continuing our mission to provide opportunities for both participants and performance opportunities for the community. And hopefully this will continue for a long time to come. And I hope to see you soon at the Country Gay Playhouse.